This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 11th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why it's not just Democrats, but how Republicans also are pushing for increased spending or reduced revenues without addressing the issue of who pays. Second, we explain why Anwar's political theater and what Alaska is receiving as part of the script. And third, we discuss some new charts we are publishing that track the waterfall provisions of this year's budget, the earnings reserve account, and how much in-state taxes Alaskans are paying to support the FY24 budget. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into the weekly top three and talk a little bit about this stuff. Um, I can see where all this is going. The incentives and the spendings and the plans and all the stuff that they've got going on out there. Everybody's got a plan for how to spend our money. Let's uh, let's start there this morning and get things uh, get things rolling. Well, Michael, we've been whacking on Democrats uh, for the past few shows about writing op-eds and making proposals for increased K through 12 spending um, and, uh, and increased university spending and child government or state supported child care and all the other things. And we've always asked the question, who pays? I mean, you, you, you wanna spend, got it, understand understand your proposal, but who pays? And they and they never talk about that. And, and, and we know who pays in the end, it's always, P additional PFD cuts will be will be who pays, and there'll be middle and lower income Alaska families who pay. Uh, only Alaska families, since we don't tax non-residents, uh, the only state in the union that doesn't tax non-residents. Um, it'll and and we know who it is. So we've been whacking on Democrats about that. Now it's now it's Republicans. <laughs> Republicans turn in the in the in the bucket. There are several opinion pieces and articles that have come out in the last week. That, that, that shows that it's not just Democrats that want to spend and want to avoid the question of who pays. It's Republicans as well. Nat Hertz has a piece in the, in the Alaska Beacon uh, talking about various things, but one of them uh, is tax breaks uh, that could be in the works for Cook Inlet gas producers. Now, you and I talked about this a while back when we first started, when, when the Cook Inlet first started being a deal again. And, and, and the shortfalls in the Cook Inlet and concerns about Cook Inlet gas supply. And I said at the time, uh, and I've got the tape on this, if anybody wants to challenge me, I said at the time, just wait, somebody will be talking about government incentives for increased Cook Inlet production. And sure enough, uh, uh, Nat Hertz has an article uh, that, that encapsulates or reports on two sources of, of people talking about uh, uh, Cook Inlet gas credits uh, credits, tax credits uh, to Cook Inlet producers. One is Governor Dunleavy uh, as a, as part of the proposal uh, coming up, as part of a proposal uh, coming up this, this session. But the second was sort of surprising to me. Sutton Republican Representative George Rauscher will also file his own legislation to eliminate, not just reduce, but to eliminate taxes and royalty payments for Cook Inlet gas discoveries. He said in an interview, Rauscher is the vice chair of the House Resources Committee, which is jurisdiction over oil and gas policy. And he's also a member of the chamber's GOP-led majority. Now, 
I'm not going to argue yet about whether it's a good thing to uh, to give these tax credits and or or in the case of Rousher, elimination of royalty and taxes for new Cook Inlet gas production. We can argue, we'll, we'll argue about that in a subsequent show. But here's here's my point about this: Who's going to pay for those for those elimination of tax credits? What are called tax expenditures? Uh, the elimination of taxes on on Cook Inlet gas, the elimination of tax and royalty on Cook, Cook Inlet gas. Who's going to pay? And Rousher doesn't discuss that in the in the interview with Knapp. It's nowhere to be found in the article. So we know. Just like we know when Democrats talk about increased K through 12 spending, increased university spending, uh, increased uh, uh, child care spending, we know exactly who's going to pay. It's going to be reduced PFD cut, reduced PFDs, additional PFD cuts in order to make up for the lost revenue that, that won't be coming from the Cook Inlet as a result of, of the elimination of, of, of taxes and royalty and in the case of the Dunleavy administration, uh, reductions in taxes and royalty. There is no way. I mean, <laughs> you, if you if you eliminate taxes and royalty, there's no way to make up for it from production, right? I mean, zero revenue equals zero revenue, and so it doesn't matter how many times you multiply it, it's still zero, right? right exactly. Uh, and so and so there's gonna there's gonna be, but that's not that's not the end of it. it Chuck Cop, a Republican, still a Republican, um, uh, writes an op-ed in the ADN about the Ambler Access Road project is more than a road. And and if you dig into Ambler as as we did in a in a landmine column a few weeks ago, if you dig into Ambler, you figure out that there isn't a, there aren't enough mines yet in Ambler. I mean, they hope to have mines, but there aren't enough mines yet in Ambler to pay for the expenses of the road, to pay for the bonds that that Ada says they want to issue. Uh, to support the road, uh, bondholders aren't going to buy bonds that aren't supported by revenues. There aren't enough mines yet. So, again, who's going to pay for uh, the for the at least the startup cost of the Ambler Road project, if not the long term cost of the of the Ambler Road project? And once again, uh, the who pays question isn't addressed at all uh, in uh, in Cops uh, op ed. It's just another we want to spend on this stuff. And, and, and people say, oh, that's ADA. That's not government spending. Of course it's government spending. How do you think ADA gets financed? It's, it's through appropriations that come out of the capital budget that go over to ADA. And if ADA wasn't spending the money, the money would come back to the, to the, to the general budget through dividends from ADA. So, of course, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, government spending. And, and once again, you know, we have, we have Republicans pushing for this spending. Oh, this would be really good but don't tax us for it. I mean, just take it out of PFD cuts. <laughs> and then, and then the third, I mean, it just keeps going. Right. Just, all you have to do is, all you have they to do is keep on a coming. Yeah. <laughs> all you have to do is read this stuff. Senator Jesse Borkman, uh, uh, newly elected uh, uh, Senator Republican Senator from the Kenai um, uh, talking uh, to the chambers of commerce of uh, Kenai and Soldatna as reported in the Peninsula Carol as reported in the Peninsula Car Clarion. Borkman said a meaningful increase to the amount of money Alaska school districts receive per student is more effective when it comes to educating students than one-time funding. We need money inside the foundation formula that school districts can count on to build up educational opportunities, to expand programs and opportunities for kids in schools. One-time money is spent a lot on one-time staff, and that's not the best way to educate kids and provide them opportunities. We need to increase the foundation formula. Once again, I'm not going to argue the merits of that. We, we'll, we'll argue about that in a subsequent show, but who pays for that? And, right. and once again, it's unaddressed. And once again, it is, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, additional PFD cuts. And finally, this didn't end. <laughs> finally, yesterday, Matt, or Nat Hertz has another uh, article. This one is a mid natural gas crunch an Alaska utility asks to resurrect in-state gas pipeline. And this is an article about NSTAR asking to, to be permitted to take over the in-state Alaska, the Alaska only uh, natural gas uh, uh, pipeline, not the big pipeline, but a right. smaller pipeline that was once proposed. And, and you go through the article and it says it's only feasible. Even John Sims, the president of NSTAR, even John Sims says it's only feasible through state subsidies. 
who pays those subsidies? <laughs> we know the answer to that. Right. So it it's not just Democrats that are coming up with these great spending ideas without addressing who pays. It's the Republicans as well. The problem is on both sides of the aisle. Right. And it, this is not a small, by the way, I just will make a point on this. This is not a small amount of money that Sims is talking about here on this pet pipeline. He's talking about an eight billion dollar grant. <laughs> Eight billion dollars is what he's talking about. Eight years worth of people's dividends going into this thing all by its lonesome. I mean, I understand that there would be payoffs to that, but eight billion dollars. It, it just the stuff just the hit, like I said, the hits just keep on a coming on this. Well, there's there's payoffs. I mean, there's payoffs to all this. People would argue there's payoffs to all this. Sure. Okay, you reduce the taxes on on Cook Inlet. You may get you may get more Cook Inlet gas. That'd be great for South Central. And Fairbanks, because we send up gas by wire, we send up electricity generated by gas. So Fairbanks and Anchorage would benefit from that. Sure, um, you know, the Ambler Road would be great for mines. Sure, additional K through 12 spending would be, might be good for kids. Sure, you know, $8 billion for, but who pays? That's, that's my point today. Nobody, not Democrats who, who we excoriate on this, on this program, time and time again, justifiably so, for their proposals to spend without addressing who pays. Not Democrats, not Republicans. It's just everybody wants to, oh my gosh, there's 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 spare PFD money out there that hasn't been yeah, hasn't no. been appropriated yet. Let's just oh, go take that. Well wait, that was the comment from that was a comment from Bjorkman where he's like, uh, the budget document passed this year, Bjorkman said, provides fiscal stability for Alaska by not <laughs> implementing a broad-based tax and not increasing taxes on the industry. The document gives Alaskans a $1,300 permanent fund dividend and leaves the state with a $375 million surplus. I love how he's like, this is a this is a fiscal plan. He called it a durable fiscal plan. It's oh, only as terrible as the money left. I mean, wow, wow. Oh, and that and that and that ICER economics professor that 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 clearly states PFD cuts are taxes. Let's be honest, said Matt Berman, the longest serving uh, uh, economics professor, goes back to the eighties. Understood the beginning of the understands the beginning. Lived through the beginning of the of the PF, PFD program. Let's let's be clear. PFD cuts are taxes. I mean, Bjorkman said, ah. PFD cuts taxes? No, they're not. That's different. Taxes are things that affect the top twenty percent. Those are taxes. That's a fiscal <laughs> plan. That's a fiscal <laughs> plan. I mean, and we're and we're not doing that. Oh man, this whole comment from Bjorkman about how this is a durable fiscal plan was just enough to make my freaking head explode. I was like, what? I mean, this is that's the plan. That is the plan. He said, uh, you know, they have a longer term goal of crafting a, this, this this durable fiscal plan. This one is great, though. He loves it. It provides fiscal stability by sucking all the money out of the private economy and putting it into the government economy. I'm sorry. What he meant was fiscal stability for the state. Fiscal, right? fiscal stability for the state and fiscal stability for the top 20%. Yeah, you, don't have, exactly. you don't have to contribute to the costs. That, they're 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 great with it, and Jesse, yeah. who just got a got a raise, got a big raise out of out of the legislature in his legislative job, and also is a K through is a K through twelve educator down in Kenai. Jesse's in the top twenty percent now, so yeah, this oh, is yeah. great. It's it's stable. I don't have to take anything out of my pocket. Yippee! Put, put me in, Coach. I want that big sixty seven percent juicy raise. That's what we need right here to bolster my retirement. That's uh, what it's all about. Oh my, my head is just going to explode on this stuff. But I mean, again, you could see the theater of all this stuff just kind of popping up in all these different little subcategories. Not only not asking who pays, but coming up with plenty of ideas on how to spend all that money. Yeah. Got a problem? Ah, the state will pay for it. State will provide incentives for it. The state will, you know, the state will fund it. The eight billion, by, by the way, to put that in context, the eight, the in-state line costs ten billion dollars. So what Sims, whose wife, by the way, is part of the Binkley family. So if we see an op-ed showing up in the in the Binkley family blog talking about you know how great an in-state pipeline is, we'll know where that comes from. Um, but but Sims wants an eight billion sub eight billion dollar subsidy on a ten billion dollar pipeline. He's willing to raise two billion. <laughs> thanks thanks he can make the economics work for two billion.
It's like I got a, I got my twenty percent match. Would you guys just pay for everything else? That's fine. <laughs> I want to buy a house. I'll put twenty percent down. You pay for the rest. That's what I want. I want a house. That's you know, Brad. Can I talk to you, Sugar Daddy? Can you can you hook me up with that? I'll pay the twenty percent. You pay the rest. Uh, you know, again, not that we wouldn't benefit from an in-state gas line, but again, where does the money come from? I mean, if the money ferry came from the sky, hell, I'd build a large pipeline all the way from the slope to Tidewater because, sure, we could export and we'd have great, but who's going to pay for it? You know, none of these articles would have been written. None of these articles would have been written if if the way we were paying for this was a balanced, broad-based broad -based approach that included all Alaska families as well as non-residents. None of these articles would be written. George Rauscher wouldn't be talking about reducing taxes on the oil industry. Chuck Kopp wouldn't be talking about, you know, the Ambler Road project. Well, Chuck Kopp might, but Chuck Kopp wouldn't be talking about the, I don't think he'd be talking about the Am Ambler Road project. Jesse Bjorkman wouldn't be talking about increased K through 12 spending. And, and John Sims wouldn't be talking about an $8 billion. If the top 20% had to pay for these, if Natasha von Imhoff, Bert Stedman, Click Bishop, if they had to help contribute to this, none of this would be, none of this spending would be going on. The only reason this is going on is because they think they can push the cost down to middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, uh, through PFD cuts and keep the top 20% non-residents and the oil companies insulated from having to contribute any of it. And, and, and it's just, I mean, so you're going to see, you, we see the Democrats do it. And we complain about it, but let's not let's not think for a moment that it's just isolated to the Democrats. The Republicans, the Republicans, right. no, just want to spend on different things. They want to spend. They just want to spend on different things. Well, that's the thing. It's not a Republican or Democrat thing. It's a bigger government. The public economy is more important than everything else group versus the smaller, more limited government. The private economy is the driving force behind everything group. That's what it's about. I mean, that's the that's the delineation. The R's and the D's don't get don't get twisted. Don't get confused. That means nothing at this point. It's it's pro bigger government or pro smaller government, pro public economy or pro private economy. That's what it's all about. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is our guest. We're on to the weekly number two now. And now we're going to talk about all the political theater that is surrounding the Anwar thing. We were talking about the Willow Project being in courts and then what happens with the rest of uh, the refuge and NPRA and all this other kind of stuff. And then later on that day after we talked about it, the press release came out and Biden is, I again, I think trying to appease a lot of these uh, environmental groups that are up in arms about this. Brad, give us the Give us the theater review for uh, for what's going on here with Anwar. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that might be a good way to approach it. That you know, it, I know really. Play. Like this you is did the play. Hamilton. These are the characters. You did Hamilton, and now you can do the theater <laughs> of po politics in the whole uh, thing. Go ahead. Well, no, you're exactly right, Michael. Anwar, the whole Anwar issue is 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 exactly that. It is it is theater, and and it's payback for for Willow. Biden pushed back on his environmental uh, uh, supporters, pushed back on the environmental community and said, we're going to go forward with Willow. But to balance that out, he's had to do something. Uh, and that something is Anwar. I know, I know we get upset in this state about Anwar. Oh my God, you know, the president's take. Remember, remember how many major oil companies, how many people with the, how many companies with the capacity to actually develop Anwar bid on Anwar when the leases came up. That would zero. be zero. <laughs> zero. Divide by zero. <laughs> and and so, you know, when 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 we talk about the gas pipeline and people say, oh, we shouldn't be if the if the oil companies don't want to be involved in that, we shouldn't be pursuing it. Well, <laughs> if the oil companies don't want to be involved in Anwar, we shouldn't be pursuing it. And and it's and it's and it's you know it's it's more it's more than simply um, uh, Biden. It is the, the belief, the understanding that, that in this country, you're never going to get Republican or Democrat. You're never going to get uh, Anwar uh, uh, permitted on a, on a reliable basis, on a 50-year on a, on a basis. You're never going to get Anwar permitted 
uh, to go forward. There's always going to be a problem with it. And so the, the oil companies are not going to waste their time, waste their effort, waste their resources, waste their money by going into a project that, that they know is never, they believe is never going to be, be permitted. And it's more than, it's more than just Biden. I mean, remember it's Donald Trump who, who Donald Trump's EPA who shut down uh, the development of the pebble mine. It's not, yeah, that's not, I mean, Biden's reinforced it, but it was Trump's EPA that did it. So it's, it, it, it is more than, it is more than just one actor that's going on, but it, it is, Anwar is useful to everybody as a political tool. I mean, Biden is using it as balance for Willow. I mean, if that's what we get, if we get, if Alaska gets out of Anwar, the development of Willow, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, we get, we get real oil, right. uh, real jobs, real construction, real investment for something that was never going to be developed. That's, that's, right. a, that, that's a pretty good deal that, that we get out of that. But Biden's using it for political theater. And now the Republicans, Dunleavy and the others, are using it for political theater, trying to, you know, push back and say, oh, that's what happens when you have Democrats. That's what happens when you have, you know. I'm going to stand tall and fight this federal interruption of our stuff. And I'm going to do it. We're going to sue. And yeah, it is. It's it's basically bluster. Storm and strife signifying nothing is what it is. It's uh, it's. I mean, it's this is this is the world we live in. Biden does one meaningless puppet play. Dunleavy and other Republicans respond in kind. In the meanwhile, nothing really happens. Well, we get Willow. I mean, and so, yeah. And and so and so I think that I mean, hopefully we don't lose Willow in November to the courts. But 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 we're getting something tangible out of Anwar. And I understand, you know, everybody's doing theater around the cancellation of the Anwar leases. But keep in mind, no oil companies bid on the Anwar leases. And it's not over. <laughs> the legislation that, that that set up the Anwar lease sales provided for two lease sales. And, and, and this is, all of this theater is around the first one. The Biden administration has said they'll go forward with the second one. In fact, when they issued the, the lease cancellation on the leases that had been issued, they issued a draft environmental impact statement for the second lease sale that provides for a second lease sale and provides terms and conditions that will be that will be that would be included in the draft terms and conditions that would be included in the second lease sale. So and and you know, people say, well, you know, Biden is ignoring the law. He's not ignoring the law. Under laws passed by Congress, the administration has the ability to cancel leases when 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 they've been illegally issued, and and the Biden administration and the courts have found that the Anwar environmental impact statement was not satisfactory, and thus the the leases were not legal to be issued under that environmental impact statement, and so they're within the law to do that, and the Biden administration said they're going to go forward with the second lease sale. Sale. Now, what will happen is nobody's going to bid on the second lease sale either. Either we may have Ada bid again because Ada is part of this political theater now. We may have Ada bid again, and we may go through this cycle all over again about oh my gosh, you know, Biden's issued leases, Ada's bid, now Biden's going to cancel it. We may go through this whole thing again, uh, but it's all political theater. The real substance of what's going on from a federal standpoint is the willow approvals. Let's keep focused on the prize here. We've got the willow approvals and and all of this other stuff, all right. of this other theater that's going on is is sort of the cost of getting the willow approvals. This is appeasement, right? Because um the environmentalists were outraged, outraged I tell you, that uh that Biden uh, the Biden administration approved the final recommendations for willow they were just, they were shocked. They were like, oh, we, this is the guy that's in our corner. We're going to go to zero oil. It's going to be all green, everything else. And he said yes, and they lost their minds. And that's where all these lawsuits and everything else came from that are going on with Willow right now. And so this is really nothing more than what's well, theater, but it's appeasement. Oh, yes, I know I did Willow, and I know that was bad, but look at all this other stuff that I've done. I've now killed all this other stuff, which really wasn't going anywhere anyway, <laughs> so it cost me nothing, and look at the, I'm on your side. I, this is just politics 101. 
Well, and the Republicans get to complain about it, right? The Republicans get to you know, shout wins. into the mic. Yeah, everybody wins. You get a car, and you get a car, and everybody, w- and and it costs nothing, you know, kind of thing. It's, I mean, this is just it's nutty. But 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 people, I mean, we really shouldn't. I know it's fun to do. I know it's fun to rant. I know it's fun to get your blood up. I know it's fun to you know post stuff on Facebook or whatever. And, and, you know, talk about how bad the Biden administration is. And I'm not trying to defend the Biden administration. But look, we got something out of this. We got Willow out of this. And and Willow is is tangible, something that, that you know, we know where the oil is. We're drilling for the oil. Uh, we know how to get that oil out. We got a pipeline all set up to get it out. Uh, all of that is is, you know, in place. And going forward, we get something out of this. So, yes, you know, shout into the microphone. Yes, get upset. Yes, you know, complain about the Democrats all you want. But at the end of the day, understand that there was something that Alaska got out of this. And it's a pretty good deal, um, uh, assuming assuming the court clears Willow as it should in November. Uh, if, you like your willow, if you like your Willow, you can keep your Willow. Uh, maybe, possibly, if the courts agree, you know, kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, that's the challenge here is that we're about to get, uh, we're about to get this decision in October, November, whether or not, you know, what happens by the way, and I, I don't know if we went over this la- last time we were talking specifically about Willow, but I got you here and I got a couple minutes. What happens if Willow gets, if the judge says no, what happens then? Well, that's what Conoco was saying. I mean, that's what we talked about last week. That's what Conoco is saying. That might be the final straw. I mean, it, it depends on how the judge says no, really. If the if the judge says no, it depends on how the judge says no. If the judge says you didn't you didn't consider this huge area that has to be considered and has to be taken into account in the environmental impact statement. And so we're gonna remand it so you have to go look at that area again. Huge area. And if it's gonna take two, three, four, five, and another five years to do it. That's what Conoco is saying. I mean, Conoco was saying, look, the leases run out. The term runs out at a certain point. Um, and we're not going to have time to go through this whole process before the lease expiration. And yes, the leases can be extended. And yes, in normal situations, the leases are extended. But here's the question. Is Biden going to make, is Biden, if he's still president, going to make a second decision to extend those leases, to agree to extend those leases at that point in time? So, And so Conoco got to go through the process of whether they whether how much time's involved if the court says you didn't dot this i and you got to go back and dot this i and it's going to take like three months to go back and dot the i then that's a that's a different issue uh it it still impacts this coming winter's construction period uh if it takes even that short a period of time three months to go back and dot the i but it's not. We're not talking about you know a long span of time that puts in that puts at risk uh, right. lease expiration. So it, it depends on how the court says. If the court says no, and I don't, I don't believe they will. But if the court says no, you got to go back and do do something over. It depends on how long it is it takes to do that over. Right. But again, in the meanwhile, theater, look at me. I'm still on your side, you know, and and the Republicans are you are all bad and evil. And and again, it's just, you know, it's it's like bread and circuses, keeping the masses focused on really nothing uh, when the important issues are in behind the scenes and they get a chance to win points with both their sides. And I mean, we get Willow out of it, but geez. Can we just stop with uh, can we just stop with the back and forth and the and and this kind of theater stuff? It's just it it's 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 not gonna it's not gonna stop at this point. You know, it is it is useful for Dunleavy to have something. I mean, Dunleavy who's not coming up with a fiscal plan that that deals with you know the, the fundamental issues that we've talked, fairness issues and economic issues we talked about on the show. Dunleavy who's not dealing with that, can can you know it's a diversion for him, right? Yeah, fiscal issues. Yeah, I'm not doing so great at that. But look at this. Joe, look at what Joe Biden did. <laughs> and, I can, and, let, and let me spend a couple of weeks, you know, going on national TV and talking about that as opposed to dodging Alaska reporters right. who want to talk about fiscal issues. Yeah, I can win on this one. I can win on this. I'll I'll get all the headlines and, stay, and be on Fox or wherever, all this other stuff. But 
I won't talk to anybody about the Alaska fiscal issues. This just seems to be the thing that continues to go. Uh, this is this is the this is the new thing of the day, right, Brad? I mean, just all this theater. Anytime there's a, oh well, we better do we better put out a press release that does nothing. And of course, this is nothing new. This is politics in general, but this is what's been going on for years at this point, and we're just seeing it uh, writ large at this point. Yeah, and and I just I. It, I don't want people to lose sight of the fact that we're gaining ground. Willow is Willow is a positive that that didn't could, wasn't guaranteed. Uh, I, I continue to attribute uh, uh, the accomplish that accomplishment to Lisa Murkowski and and the Biden's administration's desire to want to continue to keep her on side uh, on on various matters. Um, and Willow wasn't guaranteed, and we and we got Willow now. You know, politically, politically, Biden has to do something. I mean, in, just in the reality of the world, Biden has to do something that, that looks like it offsets that. And if it's Anwar, which, again, zero, you know, major oil companies, the oil companies with the capacity to develop it, zero oil companies bid on. If it's if it's the theater of, you know, of, of canceling the the seven willow leases held by Ada, that's all we're talking about. If uh, if it's the theater of doing that to get Willow to keep Willow alive, then you know that's a that's a price that I think is 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 worth paying. But it does. I mean, so it triggers off all this theater from the from the environmental community. It triggers off all this theater from Republicans. They just you know they go bashing each other uh, about it. And yeah, okay, but don't don't lose sleep over it. I mean, that's 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 the point that that I think. People should keep in mind, don't lose sleep over it. We're gaining. We gained Willow. That's a big deal. It's production in hand. It's jobs in hand. It's construction activities in hand. Don't lose sight of, of what's being gained out of this. So go, go ahead and play the games. Go ahead and, you know, write, write nasty Facebook posts and write nasty Twitter posts and, you know, uh, talk nasty about it. Go ahead and play the game, but but don't lose sight of the fact that that there is progress being made uh, somewhere else. Welcome back to the uh, program. Uh, weekly top three, number three of the weekly top three, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, joins us. Brad, <clears throat> you do a thing called the chart of the week uh, on uh, over for the landmine, uh, right? And, and for, uh, and for Facebook and everything else. And number three is new charts of the week. So give us, uh, give us the rundown here and I'll start throwing some stuff up on the screen here. Well, in addition to the landmine chart of the week, um, we do charts, the project, various people help out. We do, we do charts every day um, uh, on various things. Six days a week, we post an update of the of the oil price, the projected oil price for the remainder of this fiscal year, for the next fiscal year, and for the five years, five fiscal years following that, we update it based upon what the futures market uh, is doing. Uh, during the course of the week, we'll publish uh, charts. Uh, we have sort of a, a routine we go through. We publish a chart on uh, on where ANS oil goes, what's going on in West Coast. Uh, refinery markets, which is where most of the ANS oil goes. We post a chart once a week on what the ANS tankers are doing, where the oil is going uh, once it leaves uh, once it leaves Valdez and what the schedule is and where, what they're doing. Uh, on Saturday, we post a revenue chart, uh, what the projection is for this year's revenue. Um, and on Sunday, we post a couple of charts. One is what, uh, what the projections are for uh, inflation and what the projections are for what the current interest, current long-term interest rates are doing, 10-year interest rates are doing. So it's we, we publish various things, all of which relate to Alaska's fiscal situation in, in, in various pieces. And, and, and various people find those useful. If you haven't followed them, they're, they're on our uh, page, on, on our Facebook page, or on our Twitter page, or on our LinkedIn page. Uh, there's various places uh, that you can follow them day to day. We, we've started a new one on Saturdays that I think is is particularly useful during this fiscal year. Um, and it's and it's an issue that that we haven't focused on a lot yet. But as oil prices, as the year as we get into the year and as oil prices have stepped up, it's a it's an issue that I think is worth following. And that is 
the breakdown of where revenues are going um, on uh, within the confines of the FY uh, 24 budget. So this, but but this Saturday uh, chart that we started doing is a breakdown of the FY 24 budget uh, at projected oil prices. The way that the budget got set up, there's a there's a break even budget that's based on $68, and then as oil prices go higher there's various places that the additional revenues go. The budget's already set that up. We're not gonna have a huge amount of surplus at the end of the year. I mean, this budget's set up in a way, so we're not gonna have a huge amount of surplus at the end of the year that the legislature is gonna get their hands on and be able to do a bunch of supplementals out of. Um, at, at $68, it funds the, uh, uh, funds the basic budget uh, and we've got a portion of that is is in trad revenues, a portion traditional revenues. A portion of that is uh, is part of the POMB draw that's going to government, and and that totals out to five point five billion dollars, five point one billion dollars. That's that's the break even budget. But as oil prices go up, uh, there's there's additional places where that where the where the revenues go between sixty eight and seventy three dollars. Those revenues uh, go to an intended surplus to cover supplementals. Uh, or uh, things that come up during the course of the year that are unanticipated. And that's about another $290 million. If oil gets to $73 million, that piece, that level is, uh, is funded at, at, uh, 29, at, at $290 million. Um, above $73, between $73 and $83, uh, there's a split. Uh, the, the budget provides for a split. Half goes to a supplemental PFD, that would be paid out next August uh, or next October, rather, as a uh, as an energy uh, payment, um, and that's half of the half of the difference between uh, seventy three dollars and eighty three dollar oil. The other half goes to the CBR, and then beyond eighty three dollars, uh, all of the all of the revenue, additional revenue that comes in, uh, goes to the CBR. So what we've done in this Saturday chart, this additional chart that we're going to publish on Saturdays is we're showing in real time as oil prices vary what the what the 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 place uh, where where those revenues are going to end up. And it's a way of following along with what the budget looks like at any given point in time if those prices uh, remain the same. So on Saturdays we'll continue to publish that and frankly I find that a fairly handy chart to see what's going on with the FY24 budget, if there's going to be a supplemental PFD uh, right. and the amount involved in the supplemental PFD. All right. Another. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I say that's chart number one. I, I right. was just trying to transition. Go ahead. All right. Chart number two is something that we did uh, in last week's um, uh, Alaska landmine column. Uh, and it relates to the earnings reserve balance. There is a problem. The, 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 Permanent Fund Corporation publishes monthly um, uh, an update of both the permanent fund uh, capital amount, the, the corpus amount, as well as an update of the permanent fund earnings reserve. And uh, we've we've just sort of taken those at face value over time. We've published a very small chart uh, that sort of updates on a monthly basis when the Permanent Fund Corporation comes out with its new financials each month when the Permanent Fund Corporation comes out with its new financial statement in history projections. But this last month, the July, the one they published for July, which they published in uh, uh, early, uh, uh, when they published in late August, uh, the one for July shows a real problem. I mean, it shows the earnings reserve balance down to 540 million. So we dug into that in last week's uh, Alaska landmine column, found out that it's really, they're mixing apples and oranges and that 540 million really isn't 540 million that's available in the earnings reserve account. Once you, at the, the, the steps down go to the middle and that, that, that shortest column is the 540 million. And then the adjustments we make are the steps up from the middle. Uh, and we ultimately end up with an amount of about 10 billion that should be in the earnings reserve account. Um, and so this, this chart is something that we explained in last week's uh, Alaska landmine column. And it will be a chart that we publish monthly following what the permanent fund corporation is following to make the adjustments necessary to keep, you know, keep a perspective on what's going on in the earnings reserve account. My concern, we've seen it already, is people are going to use a low balance in the earnings reserve account to, you know, 
do a chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We got to do something different, which essentially results in wiping out the PFD. Um, and my concern is if we, if, if the permit fund corporation just keeps publishing these low amounts, that that's going to add to the fuel for the sky is falling. So we're doing these adjustments and we'll publish them monthly after the PFC, after the permit fund corporation publishes theirs to show, uh, to show what really is going on with the, with the, with the ERA. I see this chart and all I can think of is, is this, this voodoo accounting stuff where they're kind of shuffling money and showing it from a different perspective to put, to paint it in a bad light, um, to justify, is this the crisis that they create to justify the, uh, the actions that they have to go? I mean, I think you just said it, this is the justification. Oh, there's only 540 billion, a million in the, in the earnings reserve. We can't do any PFD this year. You know how you know how they get that. I mean, it's just fascinating how they get that 540 million. Is they is they is they take the earnings reserve as it is in any given point in time, which only has keep in mind only has a year of earnings or a month of earnings. This 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 is July. Only has a month of earnings, and they and they and they subtract from that a full year's worth of inflation proof, proofing, plus a full year's worth of the POMB draw for FY24 plus a full year's POMB draw for FY25. I have no idea why the hell, you know, we're, we're including, a, a creating a reserve, a full year's reserve for FY25 inside the FY24 uh, POMB. But, you know, once you do all that, once you, once you do all those deductions, you can get the number down pretty damn low. Right, right. So what we're trying to show is that's artificial. That's an artificial number. Let's make these adjustments. Let's get it back up to where it needs needs to be. And that last adjustment on the right is the prepayment. Uh, the prepayment, the $8 billion that got prepaid out of the earnings reserve shoved over in the corpus as, as a prepayment. So that's, that's something we're going to do on a monthly basis for people that want to follow it. And the final chart is, uh, is one that, that we just did on a spot basis uh, that's on our Facebook page, Twitter page, LinkedIn page. Uh, that shows the sources and uses of funds for FY24. And the reason we did this one, and the reason I think it's useful, is, is to show how much of the budget is being financed by taxes, PFD cuts, largest, re most regressive tax ever, according to ICER's Matt Berman. Um, and the red on the left, this, the red is, is sources of funds, the right is use of funds, the operating budget, capital budget, uh, and so on, and the uh, statewide operating budget, so on. Um, but the left is the sources of funds, and that red is PFD cuts. It's how much of the budget's being financed by taxes. 27% over about $1.3 billion, $1.4 billion. 27% of the FY24 budget is financed by taxes in the form of uh, in the form of PFD cuts. And I think trying to put together this chart to show how stark it is, how much we're financing the budget out of PFD cuts was a, was a worthwhile effort. So you can find that on our Facebook page and our LinkedIn page. I mean, we look at these charts and you're like, whoa, wait a second. Um, it's, uh, I mean, that, that this whole maneuvering uh, with that middle chart where you could see, we'll make the thing say whatever you want. You tell us, boss, what you want it to say, and we'll make it say whatever you want. We got a one month snapshot here and we're going to put two years worth of costs and spending in there against it and show that you have a negative balance. So you can't, I mean, it's insane. I mean, this, but, but the thing is people look at it and they get panicky. They don't look at the methodology. They don't look at the actual numbers. Uh, I mean, we see this all the time with, you know, with gun stuff where they're, they're quoting things and doing all this, but you have to look at the methodology of how they came up with the numbers to be able to even understand it. And the average person's not going to do that. They're going to look at that and go, Oh my God, of course you need to take the PFD because I don't want to be taxed. I mean, I just, you know, not that you're not getting the 27% tax already, but other than that, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I mean, I asked when I, when I finally figured out what the, what the permanent fund corporation was doing to get the ERA balance down that small, the FY 25, the FY the, is creating a reserve for the full year FY 25 uh, POMB draw was just, just sort of beyond the edge. That's like, that's like $3 billion. I mean, they get it down to 0 0.5, 500 million dollars, 0.5 billion dollars by deducting that final deduction is the FY25, $3 billion. 
And so I asked several accountants, would you ever do that? Would you ever do a subsequent year? Would you ever create a reserve for a subsequent year that's not been appropriated um, and, and has not been has not been set yet? Would you ever create a reserve for a subsequent year in the current year's income statement? And and to a to a person, they said, no, that's just really odd. That's just really it's just really, you know, just out of, out of, out of the system. That's really malfeasance. I mean, uh, that's really disingenuous. That's, you know, that's really deceptive is, I think, the word that they were looking for in that regard. <laughs> I mean, come I on. mean it's, it's bad enough. It's bad enough that they, that they, that, so, so you've got the earnings reserve. You've got one month's uh, uh, realized earnings that you're, that you're reporting on. You're taking the accumulated amount and you've got one month's realized earnings that report. It's bad enough that they're deducting from that a full year's, uh, a, a full year's inflation proofing and a full year's POMV. I mean, it's bad enough that they're that they're matching a one month income statement against a full year's deduction for those for those two reserves. But then to throw in another year, then to you know just pull in pull in a future year and pull that forward, uh, it's just I mean the the accountants I talked to just rolled their eyes. So it's I. Yeah. It, it it is I you know I don't want to accuse anybody of, of, of <laughs> I will the, a theater but it is I mean that whole that whole document is 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 geared to looks like it's geared to show the it, it wasn't enough just to show the worst case it wasn't enough just to take a full year and and set it off against a month it, it that wasn't enough. They had to throw in another year. They had to, you know, pull pull forward another year to to get it all the way down. And it's just it's theater to to create the uh, create the illusion that uh, oh my god, the earnings reserve is in trouble. It's in trouble. Well, I mean, it is. I just we can't. You can't. I don't know, Brad. I just I shake my head and I'm just like, this is the this is the these are the people that we're dealing with. Uh, over and over and over. And uh, I wish I wish I had an answer as to what. Uh, uh, as to how to deal with them, other than to do, to debunk or mystify, demystify what they're saying by having somebody like you come in and and dissect the chart and say, well, the chart says this, but here's the methodology and here's the real deal. Uh, so going, I mean, going back to those those charts and saying this is not real, folks. This is not this is not how you would do it normally. This is not how accountant you know people would normally account for this kind of stuff. Uh, it just makes no sense. Yeah. It's, so it's, I, so as I say, I mean, we do a series of these charts to try to have a factual baseline, a factual baseline for what's really going on in, in, in these areas. And, and the one that we're doing, the one that we're going to be doing with the earnings reserve on a monthly, on a monthly basis, I think is an important one because I swear to, I swear we're going to get, we're going to get a, a, an article out of the beacon or someplace saying, Oh, it's only five hundred million. Uh, five hundred million dollars. We've got we've got nothing in the bank if something goes wrong. Well, it's not that. Um, and 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 you need you need to be honest about that. And yeah, th these charts are just an effort to push back on that. But my point is, if people if people want to keep track of this, we do these charts on a daily basis. Uh, we publish seven days. We publish these charts seven days a week. Usually they're in our uh, seven thirty five time slot, our publishing time slot and our 830 uh, time slot for the for the for the ongoing oil prices. If you want to keep track of this stuff and understand what's really going on, uh, uh, follow these charts because they're they're We've set them up to be to provide useful information about what's going on with Alaska's oil situation, Alaska's fiscal situation. All right. Well, Brad, thank you so much. I appreciate you coming in and joining us. It's good to hear from you. We look forward to talking to you again soon, my friend. All Michael, right. Folks. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.